This morning, we'd like to draw your attention to Numbers chapter 6, beginning with verse 22. Numbers 6, 22. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And so shall they put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. The priest of God had a twofold duty. First of all, they were to go in before God to represent the people. As a normal person, sinful as I am, I could not approach the holy God. So if I wanted to come to God, I would bring my sacrifice to the priest in the outer court of the tabernacle. There he would receive my sacrifice from me, and he would then take my sacrifice in and offer it unto God within the Holy of Holies. I could not go within the Holy of Holies. That would be instant death for me. I could not stand in the presence of God as a sinner. So the priest would be my representative. He would go in before God to represent me. Having represented me before God, then he would return to me as I am waiting in the court, and then he would represent God to me, as he would declare to me the word of God. He then became God's representative to me. So first of all, my representative to God, then secondly, God's representative to me, the twofold work of the priest. But what an awesome responsibility it is to represent God to the people. For as you are God's representative to people, they are going to begin to develop their concepts of God by what they see in you. Their ideas of God will come from what they observe in your life. And thus it was a heavy responsibility, an awesome awareness that I stand here representing God to these people and they're going to be developing now their whole concept of God by what they see in me as his representative. And God was very concerned in how he was represented before the people. In fact, this is an issue that created the greatest problem in Moses' life. When Moses began to lead the children of Israel from their bondage in Egypt to the land of promise, they entered into the wilderness at the area of Sinai. As they were journeying towards Sinai, the people ran out of water. They came to Moses and they said, we're running out of water, we're thirsty, our children are crying for something to drink. Give us water or we're going to die. And so Moses went in before the Lord and said, Lord, these people are thirsty and they need water, what shall I do? And God said to Moses, take your rod, and with your rod, smite the rock, and water will come forth. And so Moses went out before the people, and he took his rod, and he smote the rock, and the water came gushing out, and the people drank and were revived. Forty years later, after wandering in the wilderness for 40 long years, 
The people have been murmuring and complaining and griping to Moses for 40 years. And they had come again to an area in the wilderness where there was no water and they came to Moses and they said, why did we ever listen to you? We were better off in Egypt than we've ever been out here. Now you've brought us out here to kill us with thirst. Had we not been better off if we just stayed home and died natural deaths rather than die of thirst out here in the wilderness? And you haven't even brought us into the land. And they were just laying this heavy trip on Moses and Moses went in before the Lord to represent the people. And he said, God, I'm sick and tired of their griping and complaining. I can't take it anymore. Forty years, I've heard nothing but guff from these people. I can't stand it. I'm through. I resign. I quit. I'm finished. And the Lord said, Moses, those people are thirsty. They do need water. So you go out and you speak to the rock, Moses, that it might give forth water. Moses went out to represent God to the people, but he was still angry with them because of all of their murmuring, and he began to rail on the people, calling them all kinds of names, stubborn and hard-hearted and stiff-necked, and how long do I have to put up with you, you know, and must I smite this rock again and give you water? And he went through the whole routine, took his rod and hit the rock, and water came gushing forth. Then God said, Moses, come here, son. I want to talk to you. Moses, was I angry with those people because they were thirsty? No, Lord. Well, you represented me as being angry. You went out and yelled at them. I wasn't yelling at them. I wasn't angry with them. And Moses, did I tell you to smite the rock? No. What did I tell you? Speak to the rock. Why did you smite it? Oh, I was so mad, I can't stand him. The Lord said, wait a minute, Moses. I've got some bad news for you, Moses. All your life, you've lived for the day that you could lead those people into the promised land. But I can't let you do it. You what? Can't let you do it, Moses. Why not? That isn't fair. Don't talk to me about it, Moses. It's a closed issue. You cannot lead them in because you did not represent me before them there at the waters of Mirabah or strife. You were striving. I wasn't. You didn't represent me, Moses, and therefore you can't let them in. And don't talk to me about it again. It's a closed issue. God takes very seriously how we represent him. Because Moses misrepresented him before the people. He was refused his lifelong desire and ambition of leading the people into the promised land. What Moses did in misrepresentation was a little more serious than that. The whole experience of the children of Israel coming out of the bondage of Egypt and into the land of promise, God intended to be a historic example to man. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, these things all happened to them as examples unto us. So that God bringing them out of the bondage of Egypt their bondage and slavery in Egypt was a type of our bondage and slavery in the life of sin. And even as the bondage grew heavier day by day, so sin becomes a heavier burden upon man day by day. But as they killed the lamb and put the blood upon the lintels and the doorpost, so that was a type of the blood of Jesus Christ from which we come from death into life. 
And so the firstborn did not die, but lived because of the blood upon the door. So it was the type of the blood of Jesus Christ bringing us life out of death. Their passing through the Red Sea was a symbol of our baptism, being baptized with Christ, where we leave that old life in bondage to sin and we come into this new life and relationship with God. Now Paul tells us as he's drawing the analogies in 1 Corinthians 10 that as they were journeying in the wilderness there was that rock in the wilderness and he said that rock was Jesus. The rock from which the water of life flowed to them. Paul tells us was Jesus. You remember when Jesus stood on the Temple Mount and cried to all of the people, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Again he said to the woman of Samaria, If you drink of the water that I give, you'll never thirst again. In Revelation chapter 22, right close to the end of the book, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him who is a thirst come and drink of the water of life freely. Now, where Moses failed to represent God is that it was necessary that the rock Jesus Christ be smitten that water of life might flow to all men. It was through the crucifixion, through the smiting of Christ, that he brought to us life. The water of life flows to us from the cross, from Calvary, from Christ being smitten. However, once he was smitten, he never needs to be smitten again. To receive that water of life from Jesus today, All you have to do is speak to the rock and the water comes flowing forth. Ask and you shall receive. Speak to the rock and God's life comes flowing forth to you from Jesus Christ. But his smiting the rock the second time destroyed the whole symbolism. It failed to represent God. The Bible tells us that Jesus died for us once and for all. As we sang, free from the law, there's no condemnation. Jesus has bled and there is remission. Christ has redeemed us once for all. I mean, Moses smiting the rock the second time misrepresented God. He destroyed this whole analogy that God was developing in the deliverance of the people out of bondage into the glorious walk in life in the promised land. A serious, serious offense of misrepresenting God that cost Moses dearly his lifelong ambition. Now, the Bible tells us that we Christians are a kingdom of priests. God has called us to be kings and to be priests. Revelation chapter 1, unto him who loved us, washed us in his own blood, and who has made us kings and priests unto God. Therefore, as a priest unto God, I have a twofold responsibility. Going before God interceding for this lost world. But then coming out to this lost world and representing God. You are God's representative before the world. They are going to develop their concepts and ideas of God by what they see in your life. I wonder how many times we misrepresent God by allowing our own feelings to get in the way. 
even as Moses did. As he stood there representing God to the people, or misrepresenting God to the people, as was the case, he represented God as being angry and upset with him when God wasn't angry and upset. I wonder how many times I represent God as being angry and upset when he isn't. And I am not truly God's representative. I never stand before you without that awesome awareness and consciousness that I stand here as God's representative. I stand here to declare to you the Word of God, the ways of God, and the truth of God. That is an awesome responsibility. People are developing their concepts of God from what I declare because I stand here as God's representative to tell to you God's truth. That is why I seek not to interject my own opinions or my own ideas. Where the Word of God is silent, I try to stay silent. Where the Word of God speaks, I seek to speak, but I seek to speak it as clearly as I possibly can because I recognize that I am here as God's representative and God will hold me responsible for how I represent Him. That is why James warns those who would be teachers, be careful, don't be in a hurry to be a teacher because you are going to receive the greater condemnation. If I would teach you wrong concerning God, then I would be under a greater condemnation because I stand here as God's representative and he holds me responsible for how I represent him. And believe me, that is an awesome task to be God's representative. And it is my prayer that I might truly and properly represent God in every situation and in all that I say and in all that I do. I don't say that I do. I, I come short. I fail. But it's that awesome responsibility that's been put upon me. And God help me. If I get in the way of your seeing him. God help me if I seek to draw attention or glory to myself. And away from him. It would be my desire and prayer that you would not see me. But the one who I stand here to represent that you get a true concept of God. For to know him in truth is to love him. The Bible tells us concerning Jesus that he was the faithful representative. The Bible calls him the true and faithful witness. It tells us that no man has actually seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he's manifested him. He's represented him to man. And Jesus was such a complete and perfect representation of God that when his disciples said to him, Lord, just show us the Father and we'll be satisfied, he said to them, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Because he was a perfect representation of God. Now how many of you can say, if someone says, well, if I could just see Jesus, if you, how many of you could say, well, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. You see how that the Holy Spirit suddenly flashes the light upon those dark inner recesses of our own soul, and I say, hey, that almost sounds ludicrous. I, I laugh because I feel my guilt. I haven't represented him. I can't say that to people. 
And that's just an indictment really against us because God has called you to be his representative. The only thing a lot of people are ever going to know about Jesus Christ is what they see in you. Do you represent him as being upset and angry over small annoyances? Quick-tempered? Quick to fly off the handle when something doesn't go right? How do you represent Jesus to that world out there? As they are studying you and looking at you to learn. For they long, they long to see reality, the reality of God. And do I properly represent him? Or how many times did God have to say, Chuck, come here a minute. You didn't represent me the way you reacted in that situation. You rolled down your window and you yelled those things at that guy just because he pulled in front of you. <laughs> Shook your fist. Face was red and you were angry. You weren't representing me. You got on your license plate, Calvary, you know. <laughs> Great representation you are. God help us. He must help us. Because the only way I can really be his representative is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is why Jesus said to his disciples when he said, Now look, you're going to be my witnesses. You're going to go out into the world. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you will be my witnesses. And it is only as I live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit that my life becomes a true witness of Jesus Christ. Every time I revert to the flesh or walk in the flesh, I'm not representing Him. But God help me. Because He's called me to be His representative. He's trusting in me to be His representative. As a priest before God of the new covenant, I become God's representative to the world around me. And God wants a true representation of himself. Now, it is interesting to me, as we look at our text, as just how God wanted himself represented to the people. God said, I want the priest now to go out and represent me. And this is how I want them to put my name on the people. When they think of my name, this is what I want them to think about. The name of God, Jehovah. When you think of the name Jehovah, what do you think about? You see a red-faced, angry person with a hand raised in a fist, ready to pounce down on the failing people. I'm afraid you've been misrepresented, God. How does God want his name put upon the people? The threefold Jehovah. First of all, Jehovah bless thee and keep thee. The first thing that God wanted the people to think about him when they thought of his name was blessing. Oh, the blessing of a loving God. The blessings that he desires to bestow upon his people. The Lord or Jehovah bless thee and keep thee. Know that the Lord will keep you in all danger, in every situation. He wants you to trust in him and rely upon him for he will be your strength and he will keep you. Jehovah bless thee and keep thee. And he wanted his name to be associated in the minds of the people with blessings, not with cursings. I think that any time a person says, God damn, actually, they are misrepresenting God. Better that we would say, God bless. That's more of a true representation of God. 
Jehovah bless thee and keep thee. Secondly, Jehovah make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The face of Jehovah shining upon us is a phrase that would indicate Jehovah is not only wanting to bless us, but he himself is the source of blessing. As he blesses us through his grace, be gracious. And then thirdly, Jehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So, he wants his name to be associated with blessings, with grace, and with peace. And in your mind, if you think about God in truth, a true understanding of God, you will think of him in the relationship to his blessings of grace upon your life that result in the peace that you have within your heart. And if I am properly representing God to you, then you're understanding that God loves you and he wants to bless you. If I'm bringing you a true concept of God, you'll know that His blessings will not be withheld because of your failure. For He is gracious. And if I am properly representing God to you, you'll know that God desires that you live in peace with Him, that you might live in peace with yourself. And when you think about the Lord, you'll think of the blessings and of the grace and of the peace. You know, it's interesting. We often think of grace and peace as coupled in the New Testament, don't we? Because most of the epistles open up with grace and peace be unto you through Jesus Christ our Lord, or grace and peace be unto you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, or uh, grace and peace be multiplied to you through God and and always grace and peace coupled in the New Testament. But God coupled them, first of all, in the Old Testament. When he instructed the people how they were to represent him before the people. Represent me as a God of grace and a God of peace who desires to bless. That's the truth about God. And to know him in truth, you will know his grace and his peace and his love. Shall we pray? Father, by our acts of graciousness, by our acts of love, by our responses in mercy, may we reflect you and show you to this world. Help us, Lord, and forgive us, Lord, where we have misrepresented you and given to people a false concept of our God. May we be empowered by your Holy Spirit that we can be true witnesses. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now may the Lord be with you and help you and strengthen you by his spirit within your life that you might be all that God wants you to be, a true and faithful witness of his love and of his grace to a sick and dying world. And may his love flow forth from your life. His compassion, his tenderness, his goodness. That people might get a true concept of God. As they see that work of his spirit through you. In Jesus name.